It's hard to see past your scope when you're in the thick of it. But even something simple like drawing your life out on a timeline, you know, from from birth or from childhood to now to the future, and looking at it in terms of actual years and actual time, that can help you shift your perspective a little bit and clarify in the grand scheme how little time this is. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 238. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And uh, yeah, hey, today I have a question and answer. Um, Two questions for you. Uh, I am always open to getting more questions. I'm actually not running low, but not as many as usual. So if you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover for the show, please send them to me. Best place to do that is duffthepsych at gmail.com. And I have a nice folder of questions that I always look through for episodes on there. Um, On social media, I don't always see the questions. So if you want me to for sure see it, send it to my email. That's the best way to do it. Um, But yeah, question and answer today. It's been an interesting week. You know, I, uh, for some reason, just haven't had a lot of inspiration to put this episode together. Um, It doesn't mean I haven't wanted to, but it's one of those things where I've kind of like, okay, let's sit down, let's work on it, let's see what I'm going to do for the podcast this week. Uh, my brain, my brain just goes totally blank and I, you know, can't like get anything out. Um, so I kept cracking away at it, you know, bit by bit. Um, you know, best way to work with those things for me is just to, uh, you know, consider, are there any other, you know, unique options? I thought about maybe doing a guided meditation or this or that, and none of them were the perfect option. And so my option remaining was just to try to reduce other distractions and continue working on it without beating myself up. And so bit by bit, I got, you know, got it done and, and, and found some good questions and hopefully have some good answers for you guys. But then, um, didn't record last night, woke up today with like this crazy migraine that I was, um, fighting off for like, I don't know, five, six hours or something like that. And head hurt, feeling nauseous, and also the water heater broke in our place again and had to get that fixed and then the person who fixed it left a fucking blowtorch in the middle of the the backyard (laughs) instead of taking it with them which was fun and other stuff like that so i'm recording this now oh just the day before release in the middle of the day because i procrastinated and also died from a migraine but alas here we are uh, it's actually working out to be a really good time to record this. I feel much better now. Weirdly, I was just reflecting on this on um, my social media stories on, on Instagram, but it's weird for like medications. Sometimes, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed that, this, but sometimes medications are like more than the sum of their parts. For me, I, I do get pretty bad headaches. It, I, I used to get them way more often, but they happen every so often now. And I can get migraines, you know, where I get super light sensitive and sound sensitive and nauseous and all that kind of stuff. But what really, really, really helps me is the medication um, Excedrin migraine. And all Excedrin migraine is, is um, aspirin and acetaminophen, like Tylenol, and caffeine, the three of those together in one pill. And it's magic. It really, really works well for me. It takes a little bit of time, but it's pretty damn reliable. And I was noticing though, like I've seen this a few times, like, okay, if you look at the ingredients, you can basically kind of make your own. So I try taking, you know, some aspirin, some Tylenol and having some caffeine, like soda or coffee or whatever. And it doesn't have the same effect. (laughs) You know, it it helps a little bit, but not nearly as much as, 
you know, the medication itself. And I don't know exactly why that is. It's just something interesting that I've noticed for myself. Each of those components do help a little bit, um, and together they help a little bit more. But when it's all just in the Excedrin migraine, it works much better for me. So, you know, my my bootleg version of Excedrin migraine was not working today, uh, which is why this lasted hours and hours. Then finally, um, got some Excedrin because we ran out and we we had some some groceries being delivered, and so they were delivered with that, and I take it. And 15 minutes later, I'm doing much better. <laughs> so now at this point in the day, I'm, I'm fully caught up. I feel basically normal. I was able to eat and, you know, hydrate and all of that. So in a much better place. Thank you for caring. I know you cared. <laughs> I'm not just rambling for the sake of rambling. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, like I said, two questions. Let me go ahead and get into them. Nothing too intense here, guys. Um, you know, I, I sometimes try to warn you if there's something that's potentially pretty triggering, but nothing like that here. Good questions, but nothing related to, you know, significant trauma or nothing violent, anything like that. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Here's the first question. It reads, so in the past few months, I've been trying to get educated on my mental health. And part of that has been listening to this podcast. Really enjoy it, by the way. Thank you. And another part has been venturing into some online support groups. Sometimes people are very kind and helpful. A lot of times they're not. Actually, they're downright awful. Do you have any tips for navigating support groups and group therapy? The competition to prove who's most sick makes me feel invalidated and feel like I'm an imposter for even being in that group. It probably doesn't help that I can be overly sensitive to criticism, something I'm trying to work on. Did I just have bad luck or is this a common problem? Uh, so yeah, thank you for reaching out and really good job, you know, working on your mental health. It sounds like you've been trying to educate yourself, you know, you've been trying to do groups all that stuff. So clearly you're putting in the work and the effort. So proud of you for that. And that's definitely going to make a difference for you, even if you have some ups and downs and certain things that uh, you're not satisfied with related to treatment, certain things maybe you are, it'll still be for the better. So good job with that. Support groups can be an awesome resource. Uh, I've been talking about them quite a bit recently with people in my personal life and people that I'm working with professionally, you know, therapy patients and such, because they're a great way to continue the work outside of therapy. One of the problems with therapy is that, you know, it it can be great, but you tend to have uh, these boosts. So you have basically a a common pattern is, you know, you have kind of a a rough week. And then as you're come ramping up to therapy the day before the day of therapy, you're either starting to feel better or starting to feel more anxious about addressing things in therapy. Therapy session happens, and then you have a boost in mood and productivity, whatever you're working on, you feel a bit better because you had therapy and you're, you're on the right track feeling confident. And then that sort of tapers off throughout the week until you go into the next session, (laughs) you know, and ideally all of these swings are getting less and less and you're kind of progressively moving upward overall, even with the ups and downs kind of trending upward, but it's a common pattern. And so you want to think about ways that you can continue the work and sort of sometimes generalize the skills that you might be building in therapy elsewhere. So groups are a really great way to do this. Uh, Journaling is also another one because that's like continuing the therapy sessions on your own. Um, Really quick side note, I'll come back to this. Sorry for the side note, but what really quick side note, I know, you know, people, I talk about journaling a lot and I've talked about my sort of approach to journaling, but one thing that still trips people up is not knowing what to write about. One really good way to work around that is to give yourself um, prompts and one great area to do that with, or one great way to get that is by looking at sort of conversation cards. Um, There are a few free ones that are really good on your phones. If you just go to like the app store, Uh, the Gottman cards are one of them. So Gottman is, uh, I forget, forget first names, but uh, a relationship uh, counseling, you know, guru, somebody, you know, really fundamental in the field um, for different techniques and stuff to work in group there or uh, couples therapy. But they have a card set on the phone that has some prompts that are really good for individual journaling prompts as well. And then there are things like, you know, the uh, table topics or the skin deep or different cards like that online that work really well if you just pull a card and if it's speaking to you, that's a good thing to write about. Um, Anyway, circling back to the point here, uh, in addition to journaling, groups or, you know, um, therapy groups or support groups are a really great way to continue that work as well so that you're sustaining things, you're still paying attention, you're getting more ideas and brainstorming, maybe even practicing a few things that you've learned in therapy. Um, and it keeps you going until your next session, again, continuing to, to hammer away at it in a more consistent way. Uh, but yeah, so as great as groups are, 
yes, you can definitely sometimes run into this problem you're describing here. And it's hard to say, you know, like data wise, whether this is a common problem or not, but it is definitely something you run into. You're absolutely not alone in experiencing this. And, you know, at least I commonly do hear about people who have run into this problem. You know, you mentioned both, but the first thing I'm wondering is whether you are referring in your experience to peer support groups or therapy groups, um, because there can be a pretty big difference between them. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Listenable. Listenable is an awesome app. They are a learning platform with thousands of audio lessons created by world-class experts in communication skills, career skills, personal development, relationships, productivity, and more. Uh, I listened to a couple of really good courses on here, and as with many apps, they have the ability to speed up or slow down, obviously pause and things like that. I enjoy listening to things like this sped up. So I listen to 1.5 or two times speed. And so I was able to knock out an entire course on my way home from work in the car the other day. And I listened to some more while walking the dog as well. I did uh, the How to Think Clearly course and also uh, a sales mastery course about handling objections, which are both things that are very relevant and helpful to me in you know, the things that I do. But there's lots of other stuff as well, everything from cloud computing to you know how to lose weight, improve your guitar playing, all sorts of different topics that I'm sure you'll be able to find something relevant to you. Um, it's like audiobooks or podcasts, but super concise and to the point. So Listenable is a sweet spot for those who want to learn new things while doing something else, washing the dishes, going for a run, driving to and from work, sorts of things like that. They're broken up into nice, digestible, bite-sized chunks, and everything is presented very clearly. I'm really enjoying the app. I'm going to continue using it. It might be something that's very helpful for you as well. So if you want to check it out, search for Listenable on the app store or visit their website at listenable.io. I'll have all these links in the show notes as well. If you use the code DUFF, D-U-F-F, you get 50% off a year of Listenable membership. So check them out if you're ready to get some learning done. Get 50% off a year of unlimited access to over 3,000 original audio lessons on Listenable with the code DUFF, D-U-F-F, or using the link in the show notes. All right, back to the show. A lot of times when you're talking about support groups, um, they are peer-led, meaning not led by in, uh, a professional. A lot of times they're hosted by an organization. You know, maybe there's a nonprofit in the area, so maybe a nonprofit centered around um, substance abuse or mental health, or maybe it's a LGBTQ plus group, or um, perhaps it's uh, for people with a given neurological disorder, anything like that. There's often nonprofits that that host these groups. Um, but you don't have a therapy or a healthcare relationship with the facilitator or with the group. And again, they may or may not be mental health professionals. Even if they are mental health professionals, if it's sort of a regular peer support group, they're not operating within that capacity. So they're not your therapist, right? And so they're a little bit different. On the other hand, you have what are referred to as therapy groups or, you know, group therapy. And these come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, I've run therapy groups that have had, you know, one or two or three people in them at certain times to ones that have upwards of, of 30 people plus. And, you know, these groups are considered group therapy. They're run by a licensed mental health professional or sometimes an intern who's training to be, you know, a mental health professional. Um, there's a lot of different places you can find them. A lot of times they're offered in big healthcare organizations. So like here in California, uh, Kaiser Permanente is a big one. That's one I worked with, worked in for a little bit. They have lots of groups. Um, you know, the the VA, for instance, has a lot of groups. There, there are places where you can find them within these big organizations, but you can also find them at smaller clinics. So if you have like a group practice with several therapists in it, um, or even private practices, sometimes smaller ones, uh, host groups as well. So you can find them in a variety of places, but usually it's it's in a mental health organization of some kind. I've actually run both kinds of groups, and uh, they're very different experiences. And I think there are pros and cons for both. Uh, thinking about it, um, I've done, like when I was at Kaiser, I did a, a few groups. I did like a solution-focused therapy group. Um, we call that Doing What Works. I did a uh, one of the larger ones I did, you know, when I said like the 30 plus people, that was an anxiety group. So it was sort of like a class, classroom style where I'm teaching people about anxiety, um, very much like my my online course. 
but you know, teaching people about anxiety and it's more there for learning with some feedback with people chiming in and such, but it's, um, you know, you're not exactly using it like a process group. Um, so I've did, done those. I've done uh, groups at a place called the Brain Injury Center that were groups um, that were like, th these were peer groups. So groups for people who um, had Parkinson's or people, I did a group for caregivers of people with neurological disorders or brain injuries. Um, what else? I've done substance abuse groups, like kind of 12-step uh, style ones. And those were uh, considered therapy groups, but you can find both, both types for, for on, on the substance abuse side. So I've done quite a few different ones. You know, the, the peer groups were, um, you know, definitely looser and the, um, the, uh, therapy ones were a little bit more rigid and not rigid, but more, more organized and such. Um, but yeah, I kind of want to run down the differences in some pros and cons because they both have their own place and they're both good in their own ways. So let's start with support groups. So these are peer support groups, not, not run by a mental health professional necessarily, not a healthcare sort of situation, but just support groups for people who are going through the same thing or have the same problem. Um, so some of the pros of support groups. One is that they're very often free. Uh, you could easily right now go on your browser, go to Google, search for support group for XYZ problems. So support group for let's say multiple sclerosis or depression. And you'll be able to find, you know, somewhere in your state, um, some support groups that you could drop into for free. They're out there. Um, you know, here in California, that a lot of different places have them. You know, Cedar sinai has groups. The um, like uh, Depression and Bipolar Network has groups. There's a bunch of them. And uh, oftentimes when they're this sort of style, they're free. They're supported by a nonprofit or by donations or something like that. They're also looser, as I said, in the format and the rules. Um, they're not as as rigid and, and controlled. They're sort of um, a little bit freer flowing and they can vary quite a bit in the sort of style in which they're run. A lot of times there's also less commitment. Uh, for the most part, you know, support groups, you're not required to, you know, sign a contract to be there for a certain amount of time or, you know, there, there's less expectation of you and you can sort of drop in and drop out as is relevant for you. Uh, yeah, right? Actually, a lot of times you don't even need to make an appointment. I've seen some that I've been looking up recently for, you know, depression and bipolar uh, mood disorders where, yeah, they don't require you to sign up ahead of time. You just show up, you just click the link and show up and when I say click the link, meaning it's like a Zoom meeting, um, but you just show up and, and you're there. So no commitment, no issues about uh, coming and going and such. Um, another pro is that there's a lot of them out there for a wide variety of issues. As I said, if you kind of go to your browser and just start searching, you'll probably be able to find a group for somebody like you. You know, if you want to find a group for uh, trans people who are experiencing uh, anxiety, there might be one out there. Uh, maybe not that specific, but maybe so. There are a lot. And so that's one of the benefits is uh, there are a lot of different things covered and hopefully, you know, there are things that represent you as well. And then they're more accessible. You know, um, not everybody has the same access to mental health care. Um, not everybody is comfortable working within systems related to healthcare. Um, you know, not everybody has insurance, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, they're just more accessible sometimes than therapy groups. Now, some of the cons, some of the things that are that are not always the best about support groups. Um, you know, I said they're looser in the formats and rules, and that can be a pro, but it can also be a con. They're less structured. So things can sometimes go off the rails or they can turn into something that they're not supposed to be. Um, they could be a lot more social in nature, which can be a good or a bad thing. Um, and, you know, it, it's just less sort of um, less directed than a therapy group might be. You may also have less skilled facilitators. So a lot of times these are peers that are facilitating or people who are, you know, serving a sort of leadership role in the organization, but are not trained to do like group therapy. So when it comes to treating it like, like a therapy group, they may not be able to run it in the way that you would expect of somebody who is trained to do that, who is a mental health professional and, and well-versed in running groups because it's a whole separate um, skill set than it is for doing like individual therapy. So that means that the facilitator may not be able to redirect certain things or, you know, hold certain boundaries 
or lead the group in a place where it's, you know, maintaining productivity and being a safe place for everybody, because that's just, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not, they're not being paid a ton for this. They're not trained for it. All sorts of factors like that. Doesn't mean they don't care. Doesn't mean they can't be great. There are some support groups that are like phenomenal and the person running, it's a superstar, but it, it's not always the case that, that, that is, uh, that that's the case. That's not, that is not always the case is what I'm trying to say. And then, yeah, um, other thing for cons of support groups is there's also often uh, fewer rules and boundaries in place. Kind of covered this already, but, you know, they're not uh, as formal, not as structured. And so uh, there are certain things that you might have in a therapy group that are meant to be there for protections, to give you peace of mind. And you know that certain things are just not going to happen in a therapy group. But when it's sort of just a peer support group, there's less monitoring of those things, less enforcement of, of, of boundaries and rules and such. So, um, you know, you might have people showing up to groups that are maybe under the influence and that's not something that would happen. Or they wouldn't be allowed to do that in a therapy group. And that might be something that is uh, not comfortable for you. There's a lot of different examples, but regardless, uh, you know, these are some of these things are both pros and cons. It just depends on what you want out of your experience. If you want something that is looser, less, you know, um, less monitored and stuff like that, and that works well for you, then great. If it's not something that works for you, then that would be, you know, something that's a detractor here. Um, and then, so therapy groups, group therapy, what are some of the pros of that? So one of the pros of group therapy is that uh, groups are often run um, you know, kind of over and over, they might be running, you know, every quarter or something like that. And so they have time to basically perfect these groups and, um, develop resources for them. So maybe you actually have handouts, you have, um, exercises, things that you do both in the group therapy session and outside of the group therapy session. You know, let's say it's a, a DBT group. So like a dialectical behavior therapy group, you're going to have lots of different handouts, maybe even books, things that you're using to take with you to, to practice skills outside of both individual and group sessions. Um, but yeah, so more resources, more planning, more structure, you can count on it to be a little bit more reliable than just a peer led group. Um, sometimes also the makeup of the group is taken into account. So for instance, if you're in a, um, you know, healthcare organization and you're joining into a smaller therapy group, they might actually have a little intake with you beforehand and interview you to make sure that what you want out of the group is going to be appropriate. You're going to get what you need from it. And also, you know, you might be, um, you know, uh, kind of looked at with your fit in the group. Um, there, they maybe have, maybe have certain parameters about, um, you know, types of individuals they want in the group, not in a discriminatory sort of way, but, um, you know, it's something that people just need to keep in mind. A group facilitator needs to keep in mind. Um, for instance, if you're running a group about, um, say just anxiety and you have, you know, um, 70% people that have borderline personality disorder, this is going to be something that really heavily needs to be taken into account because of the sort of social nature of people with that issue and how that impacts work within a group, right? So uh, rarely are people just sort of like, no, you're, you're not allowed to be in this group because you're the wrong type of person. But um, it's something that, you know, people may be taking into account and, you know, either recruiting other people for the group as well or breaking the group up into subgroups, kind of just dividing people up in a way that makes more sense. Um, this is going to be different from place to place, but sometimes, you know, things are taken into account. Again, um, it also might be the case that, uh, you know, you're screened for things like suicidality or substance use. And if those things are present, then you wouldn't be appropriate for a group. And so, you know, that could be a pro or a con, depending on, you know, your situation. Maybe you are feeling excluded from a group, but on the other hand, maybe if you're in the group, you feel um, a little bit more uh, comfortable and protected, not running into certain things that are triggering for you, right? Um, and then, as I said before, licensed healthcare professionals or, you know, interns are the facilitators. So people who are in the field, people who have some degree of expertise and know what they're doing, um, or people who are trying to learn, you know, what they're doing, but are obviously, uh, moving in the right direction. And so you can have, you know, some assurance knowing that you're not just sort of, uh, doing something that's not productive or going off the rails or is actually unhealthy in some way. <clears throat> Um, in therapy groups, sometimes the group dynamics themselves are also addressed. So, you know, if things are becoming, um, you know, toxic in the group or there's something that is problematic going on, it can be that the facilitator addresses that and works to, 
kind of work through it with all of you rather than just ignoring it or letting it turn into something really bad. Um, and then, yeah, there's last thing I'll say about the pros for group therapy is that there can sometimes be more assurance that everyone in the group is is trying to do something about their issues. Depending on the organization, you know, you might need to be an individual therapy to be accepted into the group. Or on the flip side, you know, just understanding that anybody who's signing up for this group, which is, um, you know, a real therapy group, is putting a little bit more investment than just sort of casually showing up to a peer-led group. So there's a little bit more buy-in. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody there is really, really trying to make a difference for themselves. Um, and it doesn't mean that if somebody is not making progress, it doesn't mean they're not trying. Uh, but, you know, it's just sort of a different vibe than the peer-led groups. Um, some cons, some things that are not good about therapy groups. Uh, biggest one, they're not free. <laughs> For the most part, therapy groups are not free. Um, they can very, very much range in price. A lot of times they are less expensive than individual therapy. You know, if you're paying... Uh, 100 to 200 bucks out of pocket for therapy, you might be paying, you know, anywhere from, from, you know, 25 to 50 bucks or something like that for, for sessions of group therapy. Again, don't take my word for just that price. It ranges quite a bit, but typically it's not free. Um, sometimes this is something that can be addressed by insurance and sometimes it cannot be, uh, but it, it just depends. However, I would say more commonly than not, you're going to be paying something or you know, relying on your insurance for access to group therapy. They can also be more difficult to find, though I'll give the caveat that right now it's a little bit different. Uh, if you're looking for in-person therapy groups, depending on where you live, you may not have very many. Um, and that's just by nature of the resources that are available in your area. You might have more peer support groups than actual therapy groups. I know as a private practitioner myself, I don't run any groups. And a lot of people, you know, if you're in an area where most people are not in large group practices or clinics and they're just practicing sort of on their own independently, you might not have very many groups. But, you know, I, I wouldn't make that assumption either. Make sure you look. And then, of course, being online makes things a little bit different right now. Um, a con, which is also a pro depending on how you look at it, is that they require oftentimes more commitment, more effort. So you're going to have to actually show up. If you don't show up, you might be followed up with and asked what's going on, you know, so there's, there's more of an expectation there and you're expected to participate a little bit more. That doesn't mean that you can't be less participatory if, if anxiety is an issue for you, or if you're having trouble sort of warming up to the group, that's not a problem, but, um, it's there, there is sort of this expectation of working toward progress in a therapy group. And then another con, which can be a pro or a con, depending on what you would like from it, is they're uh, less social. So there's going to be less sort of just uh, hanging out, talking beforehand and after, a um, little bit more focus on you know confidentiality and, and respecting those sorts of boundaries because it is a healthcare situation. And you may have rules in the group as well. You may not be able, you may, may not be allowed to, for instance, you know, uh, have significant social interactions with other people in the group, or, you know, you may sort of drop those boundaries as a group beforehand and agree on them. So, you know, some differences between the two, <clears throat> a lot of it is luck of the draw. Some support groups can be amazing. Um, this is especially relevant for groups that might be for family members of people with a given disorder or issue. For instance, I've, you know, the caretaker groups that I've run, you know, if people are all getting together and they're spouses or family members have dementia and they're they're meeting together as caregivers it's a really great place for them to vent about things they don't want to take out on their family members get advice from people about how to deal with certain situations or just realize like they're not crazy like oh my god i feel so frustrated because i have to answer the same question over and over and over for my husband with alzheimer's disease and it gets me so irritated and i feel like a terrible person and then everybody else can go oh my god me too i understand you know it's it's hard not to take it personally and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly they feel really validated. And so some support groups can be amazing for that kind of thing. However, some of them can also turn into, like you said, sort of competitions of who's sicker, who's struggling the worst. As I said, people can show up, you know, sometimes uh, in a bad state or loaded, and that's not really always appropriate. It's not, doesn't lead to a good group. They can become toxic places sometimes uh, when the facilitator isn't skilled and certain people tend to dominate the conversation or, you know, there, I've certainly been in situations where I was going into a peer group, but as a therapist, I sort of had my own, you know, thoughts about how to run it. 
And uh, the people who were members of the group for a long time, much longer than I was, not the facilitators, but the members who thought they were the facilitators and, and the leaders of the group, definitely had to have a little bit of a power struggle with that, where they had their own way of doing things. And I thought that was not very productive. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's a lot more variability with that. And sometimes when, um, even when a group's been around for a long time, it can sort of devolve into something that's not quite as helpful as it was intended to be. My advice to you about support groups would be, though, to not discard them entirely. Just be aware of the possibility that they aren't always perfect, they aren't always great, and be okay with sampling a few until you find a good fit. There's absolutely nothing wrong with shopping around. And as I said before, usually the commitment is a bit lower, so you don't have to make a big deal about like quitting the group. Whereas, you know, if it's a you know, 12 week therapy group, uh, you might be sort of graduating altogether from that group. Or if somebody's dropping out, it might be a little bit more noticeable. In this case, you can probably just sample a few, you know, and, and if you, especially if you don't have to sign up or make appointments, just sample a few and then don't come back to any that you don't like so much. Even if it's after a few times, you know, you just might not show up again. You don't have to make a big deal about it. And that's okay. I will say that sometimes keeping busy and keeping your mind productive and focused on these issues you're going through can be helpful in and of itself. Um, on the podcast recently, I had my wife on to talk about her experiences recently with psychiatry and her intensive outpatient program that she did, which involved um, groups um, five days a week, four or five days, five, I think five days a week um, in the, in for like half a day. And uh, for her, she wasn't a fan of every single group. You know, some of them were you know, um, fine, but not amazing. Other ones were like, not that great. And some of them were pretty good. And despite not, you know, always loving every single group, having a consistent schedule and continuously, you know, pushing forward and trying to think about the issues she wanted to work on, whether the format was always perfect. Um, just the fact that she was making that time was beneficial in and of itself. And so even if you don't find the best groups, um, Sometimes just the fact that you're you're trying and you're getting out there and you're getting some perspective and sometimes even seeing, you know, just the range of other people uh, can be helpful in and of itself. So don't feel like you're wasting your time with this. If you want to dive into group therapy, right, so the more professional um, facilitated version, there are a few ways to do this. One great way is by using Psychology Today's um, Find a Therapist tool. They also have it so you can you can filter by groups. And so a lot of group practices or clinics will have their groups listed on there and you can check that out and sign up through either their website or, you know, message them individually. You can also look for specific clinics in your area or simply Google, you know, group therapy blank. So group therapy for depression in, uh, you know, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area or something like that, you know, whatever you can just kind of Google for that. Google is not always the best because it relies on so many other factors like SEO and there's ads and yada, 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 but it's another option to try. Or if you know of organizations in your area, um, you can look up things. So if there's a national Institute of mental health chapter, or there's a healthcare organization in your area, there are also lots of great, um, sort of uh, new online, driven companies. So like in California, we have something called Foresight, which is kind of a, a one-stop shop for mental health. They have, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, nutritionists, and they also have groups in there. So if there's anything like that, that you have access to in your area, you might check there to see if they're running groups. Um, you know, and when in doubt, if you have an individual therapist, you can always reach out to them and ask if they know about any groups in the area. But one thing that I will say is that with most health appointments right now being online, you have a lot more options because you're not limited to just your area. For group therapy, you could attend a group that's, uh, you know, focused and centered anywhere within your state. So, you know, I'm down here in Southern California, but I could attend a therapy group up in San Francisco if I wanted to. Um, for peer support groups, that's one, I guess, other pro is that it doesn't matter because they're not, um, they're, they're not medical care. So there's no licensure issues involved. So you can have, you, you can attend groups from anywhere in the world, really, because it's not healthcare that's taking place. It's just peer support. But for therapy groups, we, we do have licensure involved. And so it has to be within your own state. But that's still pretty broad when you're talking about the internet. So, you know, if from, from one point in the state, you can be attending a group that's very, perfect and focused on your type of issue from a whole other part of the state. And that's okay because you're online. 
So actually a little bit of a benefit right now during this this period of the you know COVID pandemic. And I do think a lot of this will continue as well. I think that a lot of people, myself included, I mean, I was already doing mostly teletherapy, online therapy before COVID. And so I'm not going to be stopping that afterward either. So there will continue to be a lot more people working with therapy in groups online because beforehand, I think a lot of people were sort of nervous about it. But now we don't have any choice or we haven't had any choice for a lot of this period of time. And so that that barrier of just being feeling weird and uncomfortable about online therapy is is going away for a lot of people. So you're going to see more stuff that um, even after the pandemic, if there is ever an end to the pandemic, um, will will still be around. Um, and then, yeah, so when it comes to therapy groups, there are sometimes groups that are around a specific issue like bipolar or anxiety or agoraphobia groups. And other times they're more themed. So maybe there's like a DBT skills group or like I said, the kind of a solution focused group that's more broad and people with different types of issues may be represented in the group, but it's focusing on a process or a set of skills or just a certain approach to dealing with things. One thing you can do is often call ahead and ask about a group before participating. So like if you were interested in a group, but you wanted to know, you know, how many people tend, attend the group and what the general vibe of the group is, is it more conversational or more learning? Um, these are all reasonable questions to ask before signing up. And, uh, you know, as I said, some groups are more processy where it just goes around in a circle and everyone shares how they're doing. Um, and there are other ones that are more like classes where you're just getting information, not, not doing a lot of participation. And there are some that are somewhere in between. And with therapy groups as well, you can you can always do more than one. So you don't have to just be a member of one group. Um, every organization has different rules, but very often you could be members of more than one group. Um, and then I think I kind of talked about this already, but you can, you know, in therapy groups, you often have more space to talk about what actually happens in the therapy group. So in your situation where, you know, for instance, maybe you're feeling attacked by something someone says, um, you can share that sometimes in therapy groups and there's going to be a facilitator there who is a therapist or a psychologist or someone like that who can help you process and address that, who's more of a safe person to, you know, lead all of you in the group through that. In a peer-led group, that might not feel as comfortable, that might not feel as safe, and it could make things sort of go off the rails and, uh, you know, go any sort of direction. So in a therapy group, you just have a little bit more guidance and assurance and a skilled facilitator to help you through things like that. So yeah, I hope this gives you some stuff to think about. Uh, as, as I said, I'm proud of you for trying to invest in your mental health, and I don't want you to give up on this. I think your experience is pretty normal, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some great matches out there for groups. It just takes maybe a little bit of legwork in considering um, you know, exactly what type of group you want to go forward with. So good luck to you, and hopefully this was helpful. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by our friends over at BetterHelp. If you have something that's interfering with your happiness or preventing you from reaching your goals, being productive, and just moving on with your life, as many of us have right now, you should check out BetterHelp. Uh, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating very quickly in under 48 hours, which is a huge benefit of this platform. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp has a broad range of expertise available, so often you can find types of providers that you may not have locally available to you, and the service is available for clients worldwide. You just log into your account at any time, and you can send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response back, plus you can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so if you need to switch therapists, which is always suggested if it's not a good match, you can do so freely and easily. And often it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. BetterHelp also has financial aid available, which you can look into if you think you might apply. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life right now. So visit their website, see some of their testimonials. And when you're ready, visit betterhelp.com slash duff. And that's better H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash duff. And join the over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and hardcore self-help podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question two. It reads, I'm a grad student in a mathematics program that is a non-thesis track. Although I'm doing well in the program, I feel like I ended up here by accident and can't handle the grad work. 
I'm passionate about my field, but I feel like I'm missing out when I see my non-grad student friends or former love interests making career moves, starting relationships, or moving away. I've been dealing with anxiety and depression since grad school started. The anxiety isn't much of an issue, but the depression has began to worsen. I'm in the process of starting, restarting regular therapy. Any thoughts? So yeah, thank you for the question. What you're going through is really hard. Um, I've seen it before for sure. And I'm glad that you are starting therapy to try to get some help with this. That's a really important step there. And I'm proud of you for being willing to do that. I know that it can be confusing to tease apart, you know, what's the depression versus what is the imposter syndrome versus what's legitimately being out of your depth. Like you aren't as good at this stuff as you thought versus realizing that grad school actually isn't the path for you versus you're just still adjusting and, and, and you're going to continue to adjust until it's a little bit easier. So there's a lot of different possibilities here. And I know it's confusing to try to, you know, kind of really think through what is going on here. Is this just, you know, the depression lying to me? Is it something else? It can make you feel crazy. So I just want to sympathize with you. You know, I, uh, I can empathize with you, actually, because I've been through this, being being through grad school and having some of these questions. And I know it's a lot, and uh, I'm sorry that you're going through it. The first thing that I'd want to see is um, whether you have an advisor or a mentor you can talk to about this. I'm not sure how your program works. It may be a bit different than mine. You're talking about mathematics, not sort of a you know social science um, like like psychology. Obviously, in our program, we're very people focused and, you know, we all have mentors and advisors and it's a thesis track. So you're working with someone individually on kind of getting through your program and stuff. So I don't know if you have somebody that you have quarterly or weekly meetings with who's trying to help you help you through the program. But if so, if you have a faculty member who, you know, you can talk to who has seen a lot of people go through this, who have come and gone through the program and they're kind of familiar with you, that might be a great person to talk to about this, to share honestly, like I'm having doubts about the program. I feel like I'm not catching up as well. I feel like I'm, I'm not going to be getting anywhere from this. And just seeing what they say, because if they see you struggling, but they feel like you definitely have it in you, you know, you look like somebody who's been through the program before, you have the same strengths, and they've seen people like you get through this just fine in the end, maybe they can reassure you about that. Or if they can tell, you know, something is really not jiving between you and the program and it's not working out very well, maybe they can be honest about that and suggest some adjustments or things that they feel like could be helpful to see if this will be a good fit for you. I think that your concerns about your friends moving forward with their lives and and doing cool things is totally legitimate. You know, grad school is an investment. Financially, obviously, but also in terms of your time and stress and effort, and you do make some sacrifices for it, things that you would be able to do otherwise. It's a lot. And you're basically saying to yourself that your end goal, what you want to get out of this is worth it. You know, you do have to give certain things up in the short term with the hope that it's worth it in the long term. And, you know, um, this will allow you to do certain things and it will not allow you to do certain things in the time that you're there. So it's it's a balancing act and there are pros and cons to it. And that's something that everybody needs to consider. It's not just sort of like the next step along the line. Um, you know, if you're going into a certain field, there are certain fields like mine where grad school is something that you basically have to do if you want to work with people. But even within that, there are varying degrees of what type of school and what type of program and stuff. So... You know, I think that your concerns about that are totally legitimate. And I think there are there are many ways to tackle graduate school. I think it's very common for people to find that they're they're in a place where they need to find a better balance, right, with what they're doing so they don't burn out. I think a lot of people sort of hit the ground running really hard and when they get to grad school and then start to start to struggle with it around the second year or even in the second, uh, you know, second semester of the first year. And it's common to try to find a have to find a better balance and a way to do that just so you don't hurt yourself. So you don't, you know, really sacrifice your mental health and all of that. But it's OK if you're also having doubts about whether you need to be in the program at all. This is something that nobody can give you the right answer to. There's no perfect answer here, but I would advise you to do a lot of journaling, a lot of self-reflection, and if possible, a lot of collecting thoughts from other people that you trust, friends, family members, advisors, you know, even peers. Maybe it's time for you to break out a piece of paper and think about, okay, what will things look like in five years if I continue this trajectory that I'm on? And what will things look like in five years if I don't? And what's the difference between the two? Which do I feel more comfortable with? What is what, what here do I actually want? 
you might need to take a step back and look at where you are and where you'd like to go with your life and your career. You know, what would you like to do? I know that's sometimes a big question, but it may be time to reevaluate that. And then consider whether graduate school is the best or is the only option for this. For instance, in my field, a lot of people go into a psychology or clinical psychology, counseling psychology, PhD program, and they realize that really they only want to do therapy and they don't need to go through a PhD program for that. They only need a master's level degree for that, which is two years instead of five plus years and without a dissertation, right? So why why have to go through all of that? So they decide to not spend the extra money and heartache of a PhD program and instead start making money, (laughs) start making money sooner and doing what they want with an MFT, you know, or LCSW or other master's level psychology degree. So they're able to get to the actual career they want. And they just realize that, oh, I didn't have to get into this PhD program to do all of that. And I don't want to do the other stuff. Nothing wrong with that. So asking yourself these questions that can be understandably scary is totally reasonable. I think that it's it's okay for you to to evaluate whether this is a good idea for you for, or not. And I think a lot of us avoid that because it feels like a house of cards. It's like, okay, we got in, we've been looking just straight forward to the future and putting our head down and getting to work this whole time. If we admit to ourselves that um, this might not be the right path, everything comes crumbling down. And that doesn't always have to be the case. You know, you have to sort of pull off that Band-Aid and be honest with yourself and and say, okay, is this right for me or not? And it's okay to be thinking about that. But you also need to make sure that you are questioning your assumptions and not just seeing the world through those sort of shit-colored glasses that you can have when you're depressed. Everything can look bad and negative and, you know, supporting your sort of internal hypothesis that you're not smart enough or that you don't deserve to be here. That can be the depression side that's talking. So you need to be careful with that. The language you are using in this question makes me feel like you think you're running out of time. You are not. You're not running out of time. It's hard to see past your scope when you're in the thick of it. But even something simple like drawing your life out on a timeline, you know, from from birth or from childhood to now to the future and looking at it in terms of actual years and actual time That can help you shift your perspective a little bit and clarify in the grand scheme how little time this is. You have time. But, of course, you need to survive this time and you need to make it through with your mental health somewhat intact. So if you're able to do that, then you have time. You're not running out of time to do these other things that you want to do in your life. You're not going to be old and dusted by the time you get out of your program. It's not about that. It's just about what you're going through right now. It feels like you're running out of time, but you're not. And you're jealous of people who are doing things other than graduate school because those other things are, you know, sometimes legitimately funner and nicer. But again, you're trying to decide whether between your values and what you want to get out of the program, whether this is worth it to you. You also might have an unrealistic understanding of how everyone else in your program is doing. I've seen this a lot in my own personal experience. You know, you might feel like they're naturally getting it and are smarter than you, when in reality, they're also struggling in their own way. I definitely had the experience of, you know, I can recall specific instances in my program where people thought I was doing a lot better than I was. Like, like, are you just a genius? Like, do you just get this stuff? And to me, I'm like, no, you're like way smarter. I feel like you're demonstrably way smarter than I am. And you're going to, you're, you probably get better scores on all these tests and all these things. Um, something about my personality or the questions I ask in class or the way that I, you know, carry myself makes it seem like I'm a lot more of a natural at this, but you know, <laughs> it's like, I think that was probably more my people skills rather than my intellect, but no, if like, I'm not, not, not smarter than you for sure. Um, So they had a totally skewed perspective about how I was doing. And then, of course, I would have skewed perspectives about how they are doing. Um, And so the best antidote to that is talking with your peers about it, talking to other people in your program about how they're doing, what they've been through, what they're going through right now, and seeing if it's the case that they're also struggling in the same ways that you are or have before and found a way to work through it. But if you have a chance to talk to people about it, talk to them about it. I think that working on your own self and finding a good balance between work and health is going to benefit you whether you decide to go through with the program or not. You know, grad school is not worth totally throwing your mental health away. Like if you're going to come out of this, you'd be so miserable and mentally just ill from going through the process and it's not worth it. So maybe now is the time to invest in this, invest in yourself and in your self-care 
try to find that balance. Try to process this with a lot of people and just lean into the issue. The point is not to keep you in graduate school. The point is to remove barriers and determine whether graduate school is going to be healthy and useful for you without it being sort of marred by depression and imposter syndrome and all these other things that, that you're talking about. If we can get rid or lessen the impact of some of those things, then you can see maybe a little bit more clearly whether this is going to be a useful idea for you. And in the end, if you find that it's not going to be a good idea to continue, you know, you'll come out of it less mentally devastated than you would be. And that will help you move in a more uh, productive direction in the future more easily. So, you know, if you do decide the program's not right for you, I want to say that does not mean that you failed. It does not mean that you're a bad person, that you couldn't hack it. I've seen a lot of people do this. I've seen people go through an entire program and not do anything with the degree. And that just makes them miserable and poor at the end. Um, I've seen people who are a terrible fit for a program push and push and push and end up taking numerous years to get through the program. You know, sometimes you only know whether something is right for you by taking that leap and then adjusting accordingly. And if you decide to leave, you still were able to take the leap. You were still brave and you still got into the program in the first place. And you still learned some stuff while you were there. Nothing can take that away from you. And all of that still counts even if you decide to move in a different direction. There's nothing morally wrong with that. So I hope that you can start to move toward a place of, of more balance and understanding. And I hope you can get some clarity about whether this is the right place for you or not. You're not alone, even if it feels like it. Use your resources challenge your assumptions, and try your best to take good care of yourself. Good luck. All right, with that, that is the end of this episode. This has been episode, what is it, 238 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. You can check out the full show notes at duffthepsych.com slash episode 238. In fact, head over to duffthepsych.com and have a browse around. I have lots of good stuff on there. I have resources. I have more information about me and my books, my online course. Go check it out. And uh, if you feel so inclined, please do share a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever you use to listen to this podcast. It helps me out quite a bit. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. I'll see you for the next episode. Bye.